Uh, let's start here. Let's start home. Yep. So uh, we got a new report out from NOAA, uh, basically uh, giving us an outlook on hurricane season. So, of course, we have meteorologist Brittany Van Voor. He's here to break it all down. So, so Brittany, break this down. So what did you learn from this report? Uh, well, the biggest thing that we learned is that the National Hurricane Center, or NOAA, it's the same entity. So I think it's important to remind, remember that those can be interchangeable. Has the same idea as Colorado State University and NC State, which are the two other kind of organizations that put out hurricane forecasts, which is that we will most likely have an above average season. Before we get into the numbers, I do want everyone to remember that it only takes one storm to make a bad season. Uh, 1992 is the quintessential example of this. Hurricane Andrew hit Miami as a Category 5, strongest storm to hit uh, the state of Florida up to that point, at least in record keeping. And there was only seven storms that whole season. Seven storms and you got Hurricane Andrew. So it is just a reminder that you could have 50 storms in the Atlantic Basin if none of them hit the United States, and that's a good season for us versus, again, seven storms, uh, and you only have, or you have one of them be a Category 5. So let's get into the numbers. Above average season, what does this mean? 60% chance that we'll see an above normal season, largely due to El, uh, La Nina conditions. So we are looking for about 13 to 19 named storms, so that's tropical storm or higher. Um, a tropical storm's winds are 39 miles per hour or higher. Then we get into six to 10 of those 13 to 19 will likely become hurricanes, which is 74 miles per hour or higher. That's a category one. And then of those six to 10, three to five become major hurricanes, which is about 111 miles per hour or higher. So category three, four, or five. Now, again, good reminder too, that it's not always about the category. The Saffir Simpson wind scale is fantastic. That's how we measure hurricane categories, but it is only based on wind. Sometimes some of the worst storm surge can happen from storms that aren't a cat three, cat four, cat five. Um, now, the big reason why, oh, I guess we're going to show, actually, I, I put this in a, the, the, an order that was fine, but <laughs> we're going to go to the next graphic. Uh, you know how it is. Oh, there's, there's where I can see it. Sorry, this is only my third That's time my being I in the, the impact point. center, so I'm like, okay. Okay, yes. So, uh, hurricane season compared to the other. So, NHGs, we just put those in, 13 to 19, 6 to 10, 3 to 5. Colorado State and NC State also agreeing with above average. You can see on the right portion of your screen, average 4, 7, and 3. So, why? Why do they think we're going to have an above average season? Well, the big reason why, as it often is, is La Nina which is a climate pattern. Um, if you were not familiar with what El Nino, La Nina, and La Nada, which is an unofficial term, but R, is these are climate phases through what's called the El Nino Southern Oscillation. These are long range climate forecasts that impact not just hurricane season, but our winter outlooks, our summer outlooks. So if you've ever seen a three month outlook that's been put out by the Climate Prediction Center, it is probably due to this at some point. So simplest terms, in an El Nino year, we normally have less storms. The reason why is there's more wind shear and the Atlantic is typically cooler. During a La Nina year, we normally see more hurricanes because there is less wind shear, the atmosphere is more unstable, and you see warmer ocean water temperatures. Now here's where things get complicated. There is also a third pattern, again, unofficially called La Nada, which is a neutral zone. We just ended a La Nina and we are shifting toward La Nada conditions. But long range forecasts look like we will kind of gear back toward La Nina closer to about July and into August. So sometimes we can shift back and forth between two. The reason why shifting between La Nina and La Nada is important is because La Nina is a higher than normal storm season typically, and La Nada is a neutral phase, which means it doesn't make things worse or better just based on those base conditions. However, some of the worst hurricane seasons and some of the worst hurricanes that we have seen in the United States have happened during La Nada years. Again, example, 1992, Hurricane Andrew, and also 2005, which Hurricane Katrina made landfall in Louisiana. We know near New Orleans, and in fact, we are coming up this year on the 20th anniversary of Katrina. So I think it's important to remember and kind of look at those. The way that I think of climate predictions is it's similar to when we look at severe weather chances. Like we know that the ingredients are there and this is the most likely scenario. Doesn't mean that necessarily it will happen because again, we could have five category five hurricanes, but if they all stay off the United States, we're fine. So that's the outlook. Let's talk about other things that I thought was interesting from this. And Nick, I would like you to tell me if you think any of these are interesting and you agree. So one thing I thought was interesting 
is that every single Category 5 to ever hit the United States was a tropical storm or less three days prior. That is very interesting and alarming, too. So the reason why I bring this up is that rapid intensification, which mm -hmm. we talked about last year with mm -hmm. Helene and Milton, has become a big problem. Yeah. Some of our hurricane modeling, uh, which is continuously improving, has become slightly better at rapid intensification, but what we've realized is it's better at forecasting the hurricane itself and not as much the rapid intensification. Again, every time we have storms, it, unfortunately or fortunately, we get better at forecasting them, but they normally have to happen first, you know, for yeah. us to get better. Um, so the reason why that's important is people knowing their impact. Mm -hmm. We see lesser impacts in terms of a direct landfall, obviously, here in the Carolinas, but we actually see our worst storms here in Charlotte and the Western Carolinas from storms that make landfall in the big bend of Florida. We don't really see mm. our, we can get rain and we can get all those yeah. things obviously from a storm like Florence that hit the South Carolina, North right. Carolina coast. But our biggest influence because of where we are, are the storms that come right up the big bend and we're on that right side, the dirty side, like we're not most likely to get hit. tornadoes. Yeah, most likely to have heavy rain. So that's one thing. Um, I did think that this was really, really great. Um, it just goes to show you how much better we've gotten at forecasting. So they've used 2005 during this, um, press conference is an example, of course, because mm -hmm. they're coming up on the 20 years of Katrina. So 2005, the average error for a five-day track mm -hmm. was almost 500 miles. In 2020, it was only 200 miles. So in 15, 20 years, they've essentially cut it more in half, their track error. And that is like the forecast track you see. And if that's five days, which means the three day, the one day is even better. Yeah. So it just kind of goes to show how much better we've gotten at forecasting. I will also remind folks that the center does go out of the center, you know, the track sometimes. And we really do need to focus less on like the center of the track itself and more on the impacts. But I think showing how much better we've gotten is an important I'm a data person, as you know, so it's yeah. interesting it's to look at these. Very interesting stuff, by the way. Yeah, one thing that was happening this year is that NOAA National Hurricane Center have invested in upgrades in their hurricane forecasting system, um, which is a specific model as it tries to get better about rapid intensification. I mentioned that. Um, they're putting new radars on their P3 Hurricane Hunter plane, so that will be a new tool that they can kind of use when the hurricane hunters are going in and out. They also use buoys, gliders, things that they always have. Um, already talked about that, reminding folks to focus on impacts. I made some notes while we were doing it. Um, the biggest thing that they just want to remind people about is that the biggest impacts that we have seen over the past, especially five to 10 years, have been from rapid intensification, mm -hmm. um, more flooding because of heavier rain events mm -hmm. and stronger winds. And a lot of these do have that tie back to climate change. And it's not trying to make you know, say that every single impact that we've ever had has been because of that, but it all ties back into warmer ocean waters. Yeah. Because anytime you get water temperatures above 79 degrees Fahrenheit, you have more fuel to work with, a more moist atmosphere, whether you're talking about the atmosphere where we live or the water, just holds more water. And as water warms, it expands. So of course, I douse you in three gallons of cold water versus three gallons of warm water, like the warm water itself will just naturally even take up more space yeah. because the particles are a little bit further apart versus closer compacted. Um, so just like a few things to note here. Oh, one of the reasons why they said that the mile error thing that we just talked about was so important is because you think 30 to 40 miles can make such a big difference, especially in coastal cities where a lot of people live, like Miami, New Orleans, Houston. That's more of a people near the coast. But hey, I mean, we're in Charlotte. We have friends, you know, who live mm -hmm. out in Myrtle Beach, things like that. Um, ooh, this one was good. So the University of Miami, which they're the hurricanes, which I thought was a little ironic there, but they did a study recently that showed that between 2007 and 2020, based on our better forecasting tools, that the United States saved $60 billion in disaster recovery, you know, that they would have had to pay out. And keeping more people safe. Yeah, this yeah. Is, yeah, this is, oh, of course. Uh, yeah, but yeah, you know, yeah. of course, yeah, of they course. look at the numbers to of, kind of, of course, compare. of yeah. course, of course. Well, I mean, course. I think that just goes to show, I mean, not that I'm trying to get off topic here, but we know that other than Hurricane Maria, which mm -hmm. largely did cause most of deaths in Puerto Rico, so a U.S. territory, which was in 2017, mm -hmm. Helene was the first storm to kill as many people since Katrina, yeah. which that's not a number that we want to see, but that's still almost 20 years in between the two storms. And speaking of Helene, um, the you, uh, NOAA is also working toward mapping the entire country, doing new flood mapping. They're expecting this to be done by 2026, so it's not that long, mm -hmm. which is really good. The way that they compared this is that flood mapping helped 
two significant ways during Helene. First way was there was a hospital in Tennessee that was able to be pre-evacuated days in advance because of this flood mapping from Helene. And, hmm. and we saw a lot of impacts we know in Eastern Tennessee, almost just as bad as the Western Carolinas. Yeah. And then the second, which a lot of us I think remember because there are so many pictures of it, but do you remember Tampa General Hospital, how they had to put up that hydro fencing yeah. Yeah. For, for Helene and then Milton right yeah. after, because they were like the biggest trauma center in mm -hmm. that area. They were able to know to put up that hydro fencing so many days in advance because of the same oh, flood mapping, wow. okay, especially because okay, okay. they got hit twice. You know, yeah. we knew Helene and it then Milton. It was like Milton. back to back yeah. essentially. Yeah. I mean, it was essentially a week. So I think the, I think looking back, you know, again, what we've done and what kind of how things can improve and how they can continue to do so is really great. Um, also, the storm surge inundation maps will be part of the flood mapping mm -hmm. and just updating things and making sure they're up to date. And we have just seen such a drastic impact in people being more aware of storm surge and how mm -hmm. it is such a big killer that we are to the point where we've dropped deaths from storm surge to the point where we're now losing more people due to rip currents near the coast during a okay. big storm than from storm surge. Okay. So that's not saying great thing people are still dying, but it's right. saying we've kind of shifted from storm surge being, it's still a big impact, but right, left right. from people dying from storm surges often. And so they're wanting to make sure that we're still talking about storm surge, but we're also using more language kind of geared toward rip currents. Mm -hmm. And I know we just did rip current awareness week a few weeks ago. Yep. And the biggest thing that National Weather Service in um, Moorhead City, North Carolina, mm -hmm. which like covers a lot of that, has always told me every time I've done an interview mm -hmm. with them, is that people assume that most of the deaths happen from people who live in the Carolinas. For example, if you're using our coast, and that's not the case, only 20% is from that. 80% are people who live in the inland Carolinas or other parts of the country. So the ironic part is meteorologists, we talk about this all the time in the broadcast world, but someone in like Kansas mm -hmm. or like Oregon, yeah, who has people who are going to vacation you know, let's say in Myrtle Beach, Wilmington, no sort for of Memorial awareness. Day, yeah. they're actually the ones who should be talking about it almost more yeah. because it's those people who are then coming and traveling that are being impacted more. Because you just assume, like mm -hmm. sweet Carleen Bragg is from Charleston, like people would assume someone like her, you know, who's from there and swims all the time, goes to the beach right. all the time, would be the one. It's not. It's only 20% of people who are essentially local wow. to those areas. That makes sense. So I think it, again, just all kind of ties in. But I know it took up a lot of your time. But those no, are just no, some kind no, of the things that I thought were really, really interesting from the study. And I know we'll continue to talk about this. We have our hurricane mm -hmm. special, you know, that's happening in two weeks. So we'll talk more about this data. Brad's doing some stories kind of NOAA on, like, the NOAA cuts mm -hmm. and how that can impact hurricane season. But I think all of this is important to talk about since the season starts in about a week and a half. Um, and just going back and also looking at the things that, again, were positive mm -hmm. from the storms that we have had, even though they unfortunately have killed people and caused billions of dollars in disaster relief, that we can go back and we can look at those things and improve forecasting for the future. Look, you did not take up a, a, a bulk <laughs> of my time. I enjoy this because I, I think, you know, you guys, the Weather Impact team, you guys do a great job of breaking down a, a lot of this data and putting it into context. And so it makes sense. So mm -hmm. I'm able to I'm able to follow. I'm like, OK, all all right, this may, yeah. oh wow, okay. So I'm sitting here locked in, nodding, like, oh, what? <laughs> yeah, I just all thought those were really interesting. I watched the whole, you know, yeah. and just wanted to make note of those things. And I just want to remind people mm -hmm. that yes, it only takes one storm to make a bad season, mm -hmm. but we have you covered, again, not just with the hurricane special where we talk about everything you need to know, but every step of the way, just like with Helene, we never want a disaster to come, but it's just the nature of weather and mother nature. So. Don't have hurricane anxiety this year. Know that we are here every single step of the way and we'll continue to um, do everything that we can to keep you safe. Brittany Van Voorhees, as always, awesome job. Thank you for coming in here. Thank Live you for having me. We'll have to have you in here more more often. Anytime, we'll next year event. <laughs> All right, Brittany, all right, thank you. That's an incredible breakdown by Brittany.